All right, everybody, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. And uh, this is uh, this presentation is being recorded and we're going to be placing it on our YouTube channel um, at the end of uh, probably this week. All right, well, thanks everybody for joining me today. Uh, my name is Claudia Regal. I'm the director of the City of New Orleans Mosquito and Termite Control Board. And it is my pleasure today uh, to introduce our next legend and innovator in pest and vector control, uh, Dr. Bobby Corrigan. So we appreciate so much um, that you're here with us today. And we're going to talk a little bit about your life and uh, your career and, and maybe where things are going. So thanks for joining us, Bobby. Thank you, Claudia. It's uh, an honor to be asked. It's an honor to be here. I'm looking forward to it. It should be fun. Yeah, great. Thanks so much. And thanks, everybody, for joining us today that's online. All right. So I had the pleasure of meeting, uh, I'm going to call you Bobby, right? Uh, Bobby, um, many years ago, actually, it was a, there was a group uh, that was uh, formed by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And they took the, all these experts around the country to talk about integrated pest management, of course, their fields. And I really had a, a wonderful opportunity to get to know you and the team better and travel around the country and talk about, you know, our field of study. And so I think, you know, when you do a, a Google search of uh, Dr. Corrigan, so we've got the next slide, please. Um, so when you do a Google search, search, you are all over the place, obviously, when it comes to rodent control. I mean, you are the man, right, for urban pest management. And so um, it's just been super interesting to, to see you, of course, in news stories, but also in uh, scholarly articles and trade journal articles, um, really providing a lot of great information for our industry, public health professionals, pest management, um, but it's been really uh, super interesting. And I know when I first started working in rodent control, my go-to book uh, was the rodent, rodent Control, a Practical Guide for Pest Management Professionals. I'm gonna tell you, Bobby, I keep that with me all the time. So is there gonna be a new version of this book? Uh, yes, I'm working on that second edition um, right now. It's been slow going with, with everything that's happening and sure. the pandemic kind of whacked it a little bit, but yes, there's gonna be a second edition. Excellent. That's really great to hear. We're going to be uh, looking forward to getting that. Um, and again, working uh, not only in the United States, but are all around the world. Um, and you have received many different awards throughout your career uh, from Purdue University's awards, Cornell University for Urban IPM. Um, you've worked, uh, still work, I think, with uh, New York City, inducted in the Pest Management Industry Hall of Fame as well. That's a big one. The EPA has recognized uh, some of your work as well. PCT uh, uh, Management Leadership Award. That's a big one uh, recognized by the industry. And also the most top 25 most influential people in pest management history. So, um, which is wonderful. Now I think, you know, can we talk a little bit about the very beginning, right? So where where'd you grow up, Bobby? Where are you from? So I'm a Brooklynite. I was born in Brooklyn and um, raised on Long Island for the most part. And you see here, these this is my mom and dad. And as, as I have that there, they're Irish immigrants, second generation, mm -hmm. very hardworking. There was six brothers, two sisters in my family, and I was third. And uh, both my parents had to have two jobs for pretty much their entire lives to get that get us all out of the nest successfully, which they did, and we're still a very tight, close-knit family. That's wonderful. And so I believe we have a photograph of you in the third grade. <laughs> <laughs> this is a yeah. great photo. I'm going to tell you, it looks like you're up to some sort of trouble. Yeah? <laughs> I don't know what you were thinking. <laughs> I, I don't know, but, it, but yeah, it looks like I'm trying to be uh, observational very early. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you were pretty well behaved with your hardworking parents. Is that accurate? Yeah, yeah. Actually, and as people who know me, I'm actually pretty darn shy. I'm an introvert, so I was quiet most of the time. Yep. And did you, um, as a kid, did you like biology or were you working? Yeah, working. Sorry, I guess we're always working. But um, did you spend time outside or were you into collecting frogs or what, what did you like to do as a kid? 
Yeah, you know, I'm kind of a little guy, right? I have my mom's stature. She's a tiny woman. And so my brothers are these big guys. They have my dad's genetics. And, and so they'd be playing tackle football, and I just really couldn't cut that. So while I was playing tackle football, I was the guy in a backyard on earthworm safaris, you know, <laughs> this kind of thing. And so, yeah, I've, I've always been a nature nerd, probably because I couldn't be in sports. Yep. That's great. And so um, obviously in high school, you make your friends and are you friends with some of these uh, gentlemen still today? Today, it's it's amazing. I think we all can appreciate, you know, you have friends sometimes that last your lifetime. And, and these guys you see here, we are still friends. We still keep in touch. We still email, we still get together and what have you. And, and so they're just great guys. Are they in biology as well or are they just different walks of life? completely different walks of life. And, and in fact, you, you know, the guy Jack on the, the far left in, in orange, you know, he was a he was a paper person expert for selling paper to for books and magazines. And the guy in the middle, he turned out he's a detective, you know, and, and so they used to tease me all the time about being uh, the bug guy and the rat guy and this kind of thing. And it was it was all fun. And to this day, they call me up and say, hey, we, we see these big black ants in the house. What do we do? <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's good. And so as a teenager, uh, well, I, you know, just knowing you today, uh, I obviously follow you on Twitter, on social media. So you post a lot when you are on hikes and in trips. So obviously this must have followed all your, your life here from your early years. It, it did, Claudia. You know, I, it's just, um, I was constantly trying to get out and do something outdoorsy, trying to go and hike, go fishing, you know, just play with the animals and so forth. That picture there, by the way, um, that's in the Catskills in New York. That's the tallest mountain in the Catskills, it's, which isn't, you know, for the Catskills, the mountain's not too high, but it's 4,000 feet up and, and it occupies a whole day to get to the top, turn around and get all the way back. But it's beautiful, beautiful, one of my favorite places. It does. It's really beautiful. And I appreciate you taking all these photographs and, you know, sharing it with us. Um, it looks like you like to go fishing as well, right? Part of being yep. outside. <laughs> yep, yep. I enjoy getting in a stream someplace and, you know, or in a lake and what have you. So um, a lot of fun. Those are cutthroat trout right there. And we had caught those in, um, of all places, Yellowstone, had them for dinner. It was delicious. So, so Bobby, at this time, did you have any idea that working with small mammals was going to be the way it was going to be for you? Or or you just, you know, we're, some people know early, like, I'm going to study biology and this is what I'm going to do. But others, sometimes, it like for me, it was an accident that I'm here today, right? And And I love it. But did you know at that time? No, it, you know, I didn't. And it was an accident for me as well. I, you know, getting out of high school, I really had no direction whatsoever. I didn't know what I was going to do. My two brothers had enlisted in the Navy to serve in the Navy. And I figured I'd enlist in the Navy. And so, but I got rejected from the Navy because I had congenital toxoplasmosis damage my retina, which is a mouse and cat disease, as everyone knows. And um, so I got rejected on eyesight and I didn't know what I was going to do. So I just enrolled at State University of New York and I clicked the box for biology, figuring it's going to be about bugs and animals. I don't know. And I ended up uh, at the State University of New York. That's great. And in that, uh, I think the next slide, we've got um, some pretty important people here in the in there, of course, in this picture, of course, your parents and you've got Dr. Frischman there as well. And I believe you've got another gentleman from Fumex uh, Pest Control. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah, this this is that turning point, right, that I think we all look at our lives and careers. And and when you asked about, you know, did I get into this by accident? When I went to Farmingdale, I, I remember sitting in a class the very first day, um, and it was a class on entomology, which every biology major at Farmingdale two-year college had to take. It was mandatory. I didn't even know what entomology meant. I just knew I had to show up to room 202 in the auditorium and uh, take this course. And teaching that course was Austin Frischman, far left, and um, it it was the turning point. After one lecture, I just got up and I said, 
I don't know what just happened, but um, I, this is where I'm going. This is where I want to go. I want to do what this guy is doing. And he, I remember even thinking, it sounds crazy, but it, you know, we used to joke, he looked a little bit like a mouse, you know, as a teacher, he had his mustache. He was, he was always eating with two hands and this kind of thing. But uh, it was uh, two years of solid inspiration and direction um, once, once I met Austin Frischman. The gentleman on my right, uh, on the right there was Steve Schwimmer, because as soon as I got my associate's degree in pest control, he offered me a job right on the spot and said, you know, come work for us. We're a good company. We try to do things well. We do termite work. We do rotor control in New York City and Long Island. And right there in that picture with my parents um, taking great care of us growing up and those two gentlemen, pretty much that's how I ended up in pest control. That is a great story. That That is awesome. And so from there, in 1973 to 76, you were at Fumex, right? So there's a great photograph of you, a field technician, I th I'm assuming? Yep, yep. That's me as the PMP, 73 to 76. I ran the route um, all over the place. New York City and sewers. I did some rat chasing rats and sewers in New York City. A lot of clean outs and restaurants, you know, the classic cockroaches rats and mice, you know, and lots of apartments and so forth. The typical New York City, Long Island route. And um, so, you know, they took my picture there with my BNG sprayer. I used to call that my buddy equipment, <laughs> you know, how much you depend. And I don't know how many baseboards I sprayed and killed, but it's, you know, three years of killing baseboards. But which back then, if you didn't spray the baseboards, uh, customers are like, Wait a second! What, you're cheating me. I and and they wanted to smell something too, so you know someone took this picture of me in the kitchen and I bent down with my buddy equipment and said, "Sure, go ahead." So yeah, those are my my pest control days. And I have to say, Claudia, I, you know, when I look back on this whole thing, and people say, "Oh, you know, you went to grad school and you got a degree at Purdue University and so forth," that's all very important. It's very cool, but uh, you know, I would put my three years of being a pest management professional on the job, observing, taking notes, you know, watching what's going on, equally as important as to anything I did in the scholarly academic sense. Absolutely. I think boots on the ground, starting from the ground up, learning those basics, yeah. super important. And, yeah. uh, you know, that's critical. And so, um, did you start when you started Purdue? Were you um, still working um, as a PMP, or did you just go ahead and transition directly uh, to grad school at Purdue? Well, you know, Western Freshman again. You know, when after the three years, I was still doing pest control, and mm -hmm. Western Freshman said, "You know, Bobby, um, there's a program at Purdue University, which I didn't even know where Purdue was, but he said there's a program at Purdue University where you can get a bachelor's degree in pest control." You know, you, you already have two years in the associate. Why don't you apply to Purdue University and, and see if you can get in and you could go on and get a bachelor's degree at Purdue, which to me, uh, you know, I was OK as a student, but I wasn't a super scholarly brainiac student. So I, I, I didn't even think I said, I, I wonder if I can get into Purdue University. And so, you know, he wrote me a really great recommendation letter and um, I was hardworking and all these kinds of things. And. And I did get in. And uh, so off to Purdue in Indiana. Again, I, I didn't even know where it was, but I'm thinking, OK, so off to Purdue, I went to um, as an undergrad to finish up the bachelor's. And then one thing led to another. Gary Bennett, uh, you know, picked up the, the piece from Frischman and said, said, you know, Bobby, we'll get your bachelor's. And if you're interested and you want to stay, we'll think about your master's which to me was like, holy cow, I, I don't know. I don't know if I can do this, you know, but Gary Bennett pretty much mentored me onward to master's and then even PhD. Yeah, these are wonderful. Dr. Uh, I've had actually the the honor of also interviewing Dr. Bennett and you know, it's, it's such an interesting story because he's from Louisiana and uh, he was here during the time uh, when they were trying to figure out with Formosan subterranean termites, if they were you know, what they were uh, in this region. So it was really super interesting. But yeah, Dr. Bennett, I think, has influenced so many people, as has Dr. Fishman, and, and they both continue, really, um, in this industry. 
So yeah. that's wonderful. So, um, so you finished, you, you went to grad school and here clearly really working with rodents. Is that correct? Yeah, so um, when I finished my master's, uh, you know, Gary and Eldon Ortman um, and some folks in the staff at Purdue just said, you know, we need a staff specialist, someone that can handle all the rodent calls and the raccoons and, you know, all the vertebrate pests. And would you be interested in, you know, staying on as a specialist on the staff for a couple of years? So I, of course, I said yes. And it was during that time, uh, I also said, you know, I'll do my PhD part time. You know, and so in the, the high 80s into the 90s, I was doing my PhD part time and working full time as a staff specialist at, at the university. And I picked rodents uh, to urban rodents. So I was in grad school. And as you can see in, in that picture, the next picture there, Claudia. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, all of us, if you've been through the grad school thing, you know, at least for me, I I. I was constantly feeling the stress of, can I do this? Can I do this? Can I cut a PhD program and, and get, you know, the grades? Because, you know, at Purdue, at least, it was, if you were in a PhD program, they were expecting, they were expecting A's and they were expecting statistics and power statistics and, and these Absolutely. kinds of things. And I, I, it, I, that picture, someone, a friend of mine took that picture and it was just like, you know, you need to just chill a little bit, you know, and I, 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 it was true, but I felt really stressed during my grad school experience. <laughs> yep, stressed and probably pretty tired, right? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I don't know if you know this or not, but I went to Purdue, but mine wasn't grad school, it was undergrad. And Purdue has a very high academic standard. And in one of my genetic classes, I remember it was a, we had to work with fruit flies and you had to get up at all kinds of crazy hours. And so you were always tired, but I think the staff, you know, that training of working hard and, you know, really learning those skill sets, I would guess probably has helped your entire career, right? Post-grad school, I think they're really important. And um, so I know you did some work in some granaries, right? So uh, probably, is this locally, I would imagine? Yes, yeah. So once I picked um, studying rats and mice, but, you know, and uh, Bill Jackson, Dr. Bill Jackson from Bowling Green State University, who was, I think, one of three rodent experts in the United States at the time, um, you know, Rex Marsh out in the University of California was another. And um, they sent me off to a meeting out at the University of California at Davis and um, also very inspiring. And at the time they said, you know, probably the smartest thing you could do for your, for your PhD is to spend time in the real world with these animals. Literally kind of go out and if you can live with them for a little bit and just observe, be an observational biologist, you know, and, and stick with it. And so I actually moved into this granary on a regular basis on weekends I, I actually moved in and slept on the floor because it was a severe rat problem in this granary. And uh, this was like Logansport, Indiana, and, and Delphi, Indiana, and these places. And so it that too was, for me at least, a life-changing experience to, you know, to actually be sleeping on the floor with rats running all around me. And I'm, I'm thinking, what in the world? What am I doing, you know? <laughs> But it was it, looking back, and to this day, I still get out there and I try to get as close to the rats as possible and close to the mice. Yeah, I think we've got actually a photograph of a rat on the next slide. Oh yeah, yeah, there we go. <laughs> so you know, it's the real deal, right? Hey, right. for every pest manager professional that's attending, and right now, for example, we know that you know it's hard, but when you do get to observe behavior you know, on the route, or you go back at night or something like this, you tend to, you know, carve out time to actually watch what's going on versus, you know, just putting out, say, some traps or baits or something and then see how it goes. Uh, you know, we need to see as much of the real deal as possible. So, Bobby, at the time, was there, was there anybody else or was there other type of work 
um, you've listed, a, you know, named a couple other per, um, academics in this area, but do they really have a good understanding of rodent biology and behavior um, at this time? Or was this, I'm assuming this was probably pretty groundbreaking work. You know, um, there wasn't a lot and, and, you know, there wasn't exactly a group of critical mass of rodentologists. And um, so, you know, Rex Marsh, for example, as I mentioned, and Bill Jackson, you know, and a, and a few others, but it was very few. And, and that was part of the reason they said, we need more graduate students. We, we need more rodentologists. And, you know, they were very encouraging to, for me to get into the field. So, you know, but there was research, you know, and those guys pretty much were the ones doing it. Uh, and additionally, it, from people around the world contributing, but compared to entomology and compared to the insect pest management, it was um, probably nothing relative to pest management. Although studying of rodents it, as animals in laboratories and so forth, you know, thousands of publications there, but right, real right. world rodent control. Um, almost nothing. And to this day, we, as you know, Claudia and others, we we have a still a scarcity of uh, research on these animals. We need to do a lot more. A lot more. And we have a great photograph of you in a, I believe, a chicken coop. <laughs> yeah. 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 Observing, yeah, I think. Yeah, I was doing uh, my PhD on the population ecology of a house mouse and poultry operations. And and so the person who joined me, in fact, John Osmond took that picture. And um, so uh, most people have no idea, you know, uh, what it's about in a chicken house to begin with. Most people have never been in a chicken house where it's egg layers. But, you know, that's 500 foot long house, 50 feet wide. And, you know, all these chickens, as you can see, can find laying eggs. And it's uh, if the house mouse could talk to us, the house mouse would say, this is the number one most preferred habitat for us is a chicken house with manure below and lots of chicken being spilled and eggs dropping every once in a while. You know, and so I spent, as you mentioned earlier, I'd, I'd be out at night you know, rodents are active, at, you know, at night, they're nocturnal. And so I'd be out most of the night collecting mice. You can see all those tin cats right behind me. They went the whole house and I would sex mice and, you know, age class them and mark them. I'd actually give them numbers and release them and recapture them, mark, release, recapture research and so forth. So, so I, there, I, there I am. You know, I have to tell you some, it seemed to me, you know, I, is Chickens would be fairly quiet, let me do my thing. But as soon as I leaned under them to check my traps, you know, for, for my, I could have sworn they all just said to each other, you know, you need to poop now. Poop when his head's underneath us, you know, because yeah. who knows what this guy's doing, you know. <laughs> but, you know, all my PPE, by the way, people always wonder, where, well, I just tucked it behind me so we could get a picture. <laughs> That's of right. Eye, so it's right behind my back. Oh, man. I've been in chicken houses, so I was wondering where the face uh, coverings are. Whew. Yeah, it's it's not the, you know, I should have studied moles and golf courses or something. They would have let me, <laughs> but right. I picked mice and poultry houses. <laughs> well, I think there are hazards on golf courses as well. But anyway, but you finally finished, right? So it's just yeah. great. There's a photograph of you uh, with your graduation. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, it was. It's always feels great, right? To, how do you spell relief? And that's you got your thesis done. You got it turned in. It's been accepted. You passed your oral, all of that stuff. And and so it it was wonderful feeling. I'm sure. That's great. And so then you stayed on staff at Purdue. Yes. Um, and so yeah, I, go ahead. Sorry. I, I mean, I would imagine continue on with rodents, but. Um, was it primarily now extension or did you start taking grad students on? Was it research? What, what kind of position did you have at Purdue? I had uh, pretty much extension, a little bit. I taught a course uh, for the staff, you know, in vertebrate pest management for about, for most of my length there. So for years, it was a four credit regular entomology course, undergrad, graduate level. 
And I taught that course and, and, and dabbled in some real world research, if you will, field trials and what have you. But most of my work was extension work and, and teaching. Great. And so there's a wonderful picture of you and a group of um, actually lots of familiar faces at the entomology building at, on Purdue's campus, which is for the folks that have never been there, it's really a historic, important building. But um, I don't know if you want to mention a little bit about that. Yeah, that, that picture, you know, as you mentioned, that is a famous building on Purdue campus. And for many years, Claudia, it was, you know, entomology hall. And um, that's where entomology obviously was housed. But as the years went by and Purdue was beginning to, like many universities, they're getting bigger and expanding and modernizing buildings and so forth. You know, they, they wanted new laboratories and new high-tech buildings. That building was scheduled to be demolished. They had scheduled it to be torn down and, uh, you know, a brand new high-tech building was going to go in its place. But that building was the second oldest building on campus. Yeah. And it had some real history there and, and so forth. And, and as the saying goes, they don't make them like that anymore, you know? And, but it was one of those ones where everything was creaky oak floors and beautiful staircases and what have you. So there was a push to save that building. And Kathy Heinsohn, if you, Osmond is in center, the bottom center there, right behind the sprayer that his class invented, the B&G sprayer. And right behind that sprayer is, is Dr. Kathy Heinsohn. And Kathy headed up a whole drive to get a big movement going to save that building. And uh, she did with, with the drive. She's probably credited with, with saving Entomology Hall with everybody's effort. And so th this was a group of folks that you know, were together and, and helped out with that effort as well. And as you mentioned, you know, going right from the top down to the bottom, probably most of the people in that photograph are still in pest management. Yep, absolutely. And so then I believe we're going to see Dr. Frischman again here on a, one of the um, Osmond Alumni Awards, correct? And, and there you are next to him. <laughs> correct. And at, at this time, you know, um, I was the conference chair uh, doing the Pest Management Conference chair for years. And uh, the, the JV Osmond Alumni Award was created to honor, you know, alums that have been in pest management and contributions to entomology and so forth. And so we honored Austin Frischman right there with the very first one, the very first J.B. Osmond Alumni Award. And so that was in, for those of you that are here today and you've been to the conference, that was in Low Theater where, you know, the, the you know, most of the conference occurs. And so that was, and there's John on the left and Barb, Barb Frischman all the way to the left from the front. So that's where that picture was. It was a special occasion to get, you know, the J.V. Osmond Award going. And so, and it was really special. Frischman himself is a graduate of Purdue University's PhD program. Wonderful. So, so you spent time, at, obviously we talked about your Purdue days, but then you started, you transitioned um, to become a consultant. I believe you, you went back to New York um, and just, I guess took a right turn, uh, just a same field, but it, I guess coming at it in a different way. And, you know, why did you transition from academia to consulting? Yeah, and I mentioned it was um, painstakingly, you know, hard to do that and emotionally and so forth. But at the time with my wife, we both, of course, wanted to have careers, and she had uh, got a PhD, and we had an agreement if she found a faculty position, um, you know, at a university, I would follow her and become a consultant, and if she couldn't find a faculty position, would stay at Purdue University, and I would just continue on, and she'd follow me. So that was that was the you know, agreement we kind of had, but, you know, she was a really good PhD molecular biologist. And so uh, she got several offers and um, picked Richmond uh, College. It was Earlham College in Richmond, Indiana. And so I went into consulting um, so we both could have careers and I followed her. So yeah, I hung out a shingle as, uh, and you know, I didn't have any 
any jobs or anything, you know, and um, someone sent me James Steckel out of Ohio, you know, with um, a pest control company. Uh, Jim Steckel actually went out and said to a warehouse, hey, you need to hire this guy, Bobby Carton, for consulting. And so uh, it was a great, uh, I had my very first job. And, and from there, I just built it slowly. <laughs> That's wonderful. And then you're already in New York, and I know um, New York City, the city of New York, contacted you about possibly doing some consulting for them, but I think you're still working part-time, right, for them, mm -hmm. or <laughs> maybe it never ended? You know, it, it's funny, because when I left New York City to go to Purdue, New York City was in trouble. It, it was a city with a lot of crime in the 70s, and um, things were just not so great for New York. Uh, Central Park was called the Killing Fields. And, and so when I got to Indiana, I said, you know, I'm never going back. It's just too sad. You know, it's just too many things wrong with New York City, and the traffic was horrible, and, I, and so forth. But the city of New York, Department of Health at that time, had contacted me, said, you know, somebody sent us your name and you've studied rodents for your PhD and would you come consult for us just part-time on our rat problem in New York City? And three times I said no to that uh, offer. And, and the guy that kept trying, every six months or so he was calling and will you still reconsider? And so I said, all right, but only for a couple of days a month. And uh, <laughs> So for a couple of days a month, I started, and and quite honestly, what I found was a renaissance city. You know, it wasn't the same city as when I left. It was vibrant. It was, you know, reinvented. There was a lot of money pouring in. There were young people investing in it. And I, and I, I just said, you know, this is totally cool. You know, it's a different city. And then I, uh, working with the Department of Health, which, yes, I still do to this day, um, I, I just realized the people at work in you know these civil service jobs and for for to help cities and work with departments of health it's just super duper people it, it just you know in many ways it, you know it's it's hard to describe but they're just great people many of them are very altruistic and and so to this day I'm very happy I'm very happy working with them it's it's great. just it feels good to be there yeah you know, I'm glad you made that comment. You know, obviously I work for a city, right? But our staff, and you've met our folks that are here. And, you know, I appreciate so much that you say that because cities often get a very bad rap. Yeah. But, you know, the the folks are, are they're so dedicated and they really want to do the right thing. And, you know, I think it's so incredible that New York City has got that at the Public of Health. We've got it here at the City of New Orleans Mosquito Control and road control. And, you know, that's what really makes that change, right? And you can start to make change over time, which is great. So I know, um, so that's a fantastic story. And, and I know a couple of years ago, some of the best photographs I've ever seen of urban rodents uh, were taken with National Geographic. I believe you were involved in this project as well. And I mean, just look at that one. It's incredible. I hope everyone has seen that article. If they've not, please go get it right at National Geographic. But can you talk a little bit about that project? And, you know, I, I think it really had a huge audience, a big impact. Yeah, it was. Um, so finally, National Geographic put rats on the radar for, uh, you know, you know, the Yellow Magazine. They had done an article about rats way back in the 70s. And, um, you know, we all know National Geographic, right? A lot of times it's a pretty glamorous uh, species. They'll put in there whales and wolves and so forth. So they put rats in for an urban city study. And I have to say they did it right because the photographer um, is right there, Charlie Hamilton James. is one of the best wildlife photographers on the planet. He's won many, many awards. In fact, for this picture, he won the Urban Wildlife uh, award of the year kind of thing. And uh, he came to New York City and the writer Emma Maris came to New York City and I spent some time with both of them taking them out to where rats were active, kind of a rat safari deal. And um, so, and then from there, he's, he stayed a week and went shooting, you know, setting up his equipment. That picture is great and did win awards, but I, I have to share with everybody it, you know, I, for me, and maybe for most of you, I used to think, well, I'll just 
you know, hold my camera, take a picture and hope it comes out great. You know, um, not realizing, you know, when Charlie Hamilton James takes a picture uh, of like this, a lot of work goes into that, a lot of setup, a lot of investigation back and forth at right times, picking angles and so forth and so on. So these outstanding photographs are truly by artists that that know their they know their area. And and so he, he captured photo after photo of outstanding pictures of Noi rats. These are Norways coming out of a sewer area. Um, and and not only that, but it's composed. He he didn't want just a couple of rats around. He wanted the family shot deliberately. And so what we're looking at there is the parents, if you will. And, you know, there's uh, these parents came back from foraging and all the young rats, they're waiting for mom and dad to get back. And, you know, what did you bring us? And, and where's the food and so forth and so on. So it's just an outstanding week of intensity of working with National Geographic writers and photographers. And it's it's something to behold as to what goes into those magazines. Mm -hmm. Incredible. So I think, you know, we're going to talk, I think, a little bit about just road and control and in general in these big cities. And and I think a lot of times people are missing what is happening underground, right? So I think we've got our next slide. Um, just another wonderful picture here, and I believe you've got an article talking about uh, rodents uh, underground. You can change the next slide, please. Oh, there we go. So here we go. So, you know, I often will call you and say, Bobby, you know, <laughs> what do we do here? Um, you know, like, OK, this is the situation and this is the, what would you do? Or do you have some ideas? And, you know, a lot of times it's start with the hot spot look up look down you know and move from there so um i don't know i haven't read this article i probably should <laughs> since you're putting it out there but do you want to talk a little bit about what what this uh what the photograph is about yeah so here too um and this was um also done by a very good photographer and, a, and an author for the verge the online uh, magazine the verge and I took them to areas where I know, you know, of course, you know, the sewers in some parts of Manhattan and other areas are heavily infested. And so for this picture, we stood together and I said, if we wait till dusk, you know, the rats are going to come pouring out of this, you know, sewer grate. You know, this is the drainage grate to the sewers in the middle of the street. And uh, they're going to head for the garbage bags in there. If they can, they may even squeeze beneath the doors of restaurants. And sure enough, you know, because I walked by this grade almost every night to catch my subway, um, you know, these rats came pouring out and and Josh, the photographer here, he just started taking pictures. And he, it, you should read this article if you're attending because, you know, you'll notice it says enemy, enemy at the grades. And that's truly what they are, you know, um, rats in our cities, mice in our cities and buildings, they are public health pests. We all know this, right? And and so when you consider that these rats just a minute before they emerged here were down in a sewer, running along walls and running through the affluent and touching everything. And believe it or not, these rats went from here across the sidewalk to the right and beneath two doors that were a restaurant that I actually used to buy some Italian slices, pizzas in. And they were in there for, you know, 20, 30 minutes, came back out, went back down the sewer and disappeared. And so it's a public health situation. But it's also the message, you know, for me was, holy cow, nobody even knows they were in that restaurant for 20 minutes tromping around with whatever's on their fur and their tails and their feet. and and what kind of bacteria, what kind of viruses, you know, which we're all so conscious of right now, what, what's on those bodies? And now what's on plates and forks and knives and, and so forth. So, you know, that, that for me was, was a critical issue, you know? And so, you know, this is, you know, to this day, to this day, Claudia, I, you know, my work with the Department of New York's Department of Health and, and going around, 
it's exactly as you stated is, yeah, what's at the surface? What's in the park, you know, soil? What's below the junk pile in the yard and so forth? But without a doubt, what's in our sewers of every city around the world? Because especially with uh, Noe rats, but also, as you know, with New Orleans, roof rats, too. They live in sewers very comfortably, and they're always coming up out of the sewers and exploring and also setting up surface level colonies. So if we're not taking care of sewers, the question is then, are we harvesting? That's that's a, a really important thing. And in most cases, cities don't put out big budgets for pest control professionals to really treat the sewers. We'll hang some bait and manholes and what have you. But I think that's something, you know, we're gonna have to address sooner or later. I, sometimes I think, you know, what if the rats or the mice started elevating COVID level viruses out of these sewers? What do we do? We better get to the sewers. We had, um, it's been, I think, a couple of years since they've started, our city started renovating all of Bourbon Street. And it was basically the sidewalks and the streets completely dug up in sections. But for rodent control, obviously there's a lot of great reasons for that, but it hadn't been done in over a hundred years. So for rodent control itself, it's been fantastic because it's all new plumbing. Everything is, you know, fixed and clean underground. So that alone, I think, has made a huge impact. And so, again, you know, it's expensive to do that. But if they continue to repair all this infrastructure, it's going to be, it's only going to benefit, um, you know, rodent management. And so, uh, I, I don't know if you want to say something. No, I was just gonna. You're you're totally on the mark. I mean, I I would I would say that gentrification, the, the crazy word for sewers, certainly. But if you gentrify sewers from old bricks into monolithic cement pipes that you're probably talking about, mm -hmm. the rats cannot use that. And so part of the reason for the older cities of the country, including New Orleans and but New York and Philadelphia and Boston and D.C. We, these sewers, that sewer I'm looking at right now is the sewer I, I actually, that system I started in when I was a pest control operator, but they built out of brick and it, they were from the 1860s and that brick is still there. Those sewers right there down below are still brick. So, you know, for me, I'm like, yeah, I, I've been here, done this, been in the sewer and that brick's still there and still going. But once you change the sewer over, as you're discussing for New Orleans, once you put in those monolithic cement pipes, the rats cannot use that. I think anyone who does any kind of rodent, you know, work is going to have to spend some time outside. Just, just general observation. And I know you've got your own uh, laboratory out in the field, right? <laughs> like your alleys. And yeah. so I'm sure you've gotten to know the animals in those alleys pretty well. Yep, yep. I, this is where it, this is where it happens, you know, as we all know. And um, you know, these ant, rats and mice are cryptic, cryptic animals. They're very secretive. They animals of the shadows. You know, that's how they avoid their predators. So they slink from shadow to shadow. And and that's what I always try to teach pest professionals when you're putting out equipment. It's not about putting it out along a wall every 50 feet, and you'll see some bait stations in this alley, but putting out equipment where the shadows are, you know, that's that's going to get a big return. You know, so when I look in alleys and any place, you know, where it's, there's lots of shadows and also look at the dumpsters that are here, we get it, right? We have food, we have shadows, we have lots of nooks and crannies, we have a sewer that's right below this alley. It's uh, it all comes together that spells R-A-T-S. So, so Bobby, why do people, why do you think they just don't get it right with the dumpsters? You know, Claudia, you know, I, I think the whole pest management industry, that, that's the $60,000 question. You know, every technician, all of us, we always writing, you know, please do a better job with your your refuse. Please help me help you and so forth with all those things. And I noticed your dumpsters are haven't been cleaned properly or, you know, as a species, I'm always thinking, you know, here we are, homo sapiens, meaning wise person. But yet when it comes to getting rid of our trash, we're, we're not sapient by far, you know, so we don't, 
We don't do our trash very well. Some of us do, but a whole bunch enough to feed rats and mice and cockroaches and flies don't, you know? So it's, it's a case of, we just look past, you know, I have a friend who's a, you know, she studies, I call her Dr. Garbage, Robin Nagel at NYU University, Dr. Garbage. And, and she's an anthropologist and actually specializes in, you know, anthropology through what we throw away kind of thing. And, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, she says, you know, people just say, take out the trash as if it's magic and it goes away. Take out the trash and, and we just go back into our homes and apartments and what have you and that's the end of the trash but the fact of the matter is usually taking out the trash is uh contributing to urban issues and viral issues and bacterial issues and so forth why do people don't get it it's how do you teach that maybe we should teach it in second grade is like taking out the trash is really important do it right second grade start early and so there's a super cool project with the um, the big dig, right? The new subway system. Yeah. And uh, I believe uh, underground, right? I think a lot of folks, unfortunately, think about New York City with, at least in our profession, I mean, New York subway system, you're going to have rodents in the subway system maybe. And um, what was this project about? So in New York City, you know, we kind of put in a new subway line uh, called, you know, the Second Avenue subway, you know, back in, you know, I think it was like 2010, 2000, for the part I was in there, to 2015. And so everybody, exactly as you just stated, you know, many, many people think construction, digging up the streets causes rats. And if you go deep into the streets, you know, you're gonna have put rats into everybody's buildings and so forth. That's not true, as we all know, you know, um, so, but I was, I'm there on the right. I think the helmet weighs more than my entire body and everything, but I'm far over in the right. I was the person for uh, rat control for that project. And we're down below as they're carving out the, with this giant digging machine, you know, uh, this big monster, you know, machine that goes through and carves holes and things. And, and so, you know, uh, we were just trying to make sure that everything got done right and sanitation and rat control and structures and so forth. And the bottom line though, at the end is there was no giant rat displacement. There weren't rats running in any single place because of this project. And we were using dynamite to blow up these tunnels and there was constant excavation, drilling. It was nothing but noise on the Upper East Side for years. But we found the same thing Bruce Colvin, Dr. Bruce Colvin found when he was involved with Boston's big dig back in the 80s, which is probably the biggest construction project of any city, any place in the United States at least. And he too, he said, you know, this big dig was a big bust when it comes to everyone worrying about rats. It just didn't happen. We all know that rats aren't down in mystery, you know, it's not rat cities way down below ground waiting to come up as we dig up the streets. They're pretty close to the surface in general and in the sewers and so forth. But, but you know, this is what we were doing back then. But everybody for the years, just like with Bruce in Boston, for the years of doing this big dig in New York City, everybody kept saying, oh, there's rats, of course. They, what do you expect? They're putting in a new subway system. What do you expect? It just doesn't, it's not true. It's, that's a myth. Yeah, you know what? We hear the same as well with construction. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a, it's probably in our top three, four, you know, urban myths that uh, we see. Uh, around and so again I think it's just messaging we try to get the message out um, try to deliver that to more people but you're right um, oh it's construction oh okay the rats are moving well okay no not really but okay let's let's talk about it correctly and so we're going to talk about trash here a little bit more right so it's you know I love this photo really because it is so important to know what I was this is a huge pile of trash right so I think Manhattan still uses trash bags and you guys have trash rooms and the bags go out every every evening uh fortunately you know um a lot of places have dumpsters that you can use or at least residential dumpsters but it's tough right so with new york do you think this is ever going to change um with the trash collection well you know it, this is a true 
what's called a wicked problem, right? A wicked problem that is, you know, as soon as you try to come up with a solution to something complex like this, it generates another problem. Right. And 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 so, you know, in New York City, you know, we're the most densely populated city in the United States, maybe eight and a half, to, depending on who you read, eight and a half to nine and a half million people, you know, uh, put into 36 square miles. How do you pick up everybody's trash expediently every day and get it out of the way, you know, with trucks and and staff and limited space since everything, every square inch in New York City is is accounted for and crowded sidewalks and so forth. So it's it's very difficult and people say, well, what do you expect? You have lots of rats in New York City because you have lots of trash, just like you see in this picture. Yes, it's true. And it's not as though there's um, some alternatives that need to be researched. And we are working on some of those, to be frank. We are looking at different alternatives and possibilities. So I don't know what the future looks like, but for now, it's still business as usual to your question of the bags are going out, they're going on the curb from restaurants with waste, and sometime during the night, uh, and it may be 6 a.m. the next morning, but it's still dark out, if you will, they're picked up. So the rats, Ever since, you know, probably 1965-ish, the rats have had these bags. All they need to do is, and everybody knows, rodent means to gnaw. They gnaw into a plastic bag in two seconds, and they gorge themselves, and they go back to, to bed. So th that system is expedient for trash, but probably not so great for controlling rats, especially for every pest professional that knows attending here you know you put out a bait box with really fresh bait and you're buying a pile of trash like that you're not going to really be able to entice the rats very much to feed on our poison baits when they have uh, fresh food in those bags you know we um a big issue in new orleans and it's getting better but it's still slow or these abandoned lots and so you know there's data plenty of data here showing that these lots are just sinks uh, for mammals. And so uh, with the next slide, you know, I think you've got a picture there of you with Steve Kells and in really working on pest exclusion. And I think, you know, as I want to hear your thoughts, but as an industry, well, I would say as a solution, sometimes that's really all we can do is really focus on certain properties that have an issue next to them to say, okay, you don't need to have these animals in your house. These are things that you can do. So can you talk a little bit about this, um, you know, pest exclusion um, program that you've been doing with Steve? I know there's other folks on that on that group as well. Right. I, you know, I think if we go back, Claudia, and we can go back to the earliest publications of uh, pest control, structural pest control, into the 1800s, and the the specialists back then, the pest control specialists back then, and scientists who followed all will say the same thing is, you know, the most important step in controlling city pests is sanitation combined with exclusion. Mm -hmm. And to this day, that holds true. Of course it holds true. <laughs> these, are, these are mammals. They must have food, no food, no mammals. And, you know, but... Also, if you exclude pests, it's pest prevention. That's right. Right? So just as you just stated, so when people say, well, I, you know, we're not getting control with the baits and this kind of thing, what do I do as a homeowner? I'm like, well, at least you have plenty you could do to keep them from ever getting into your basement or your house or your garage. That you can do. And so, you know, Steve Kells and I work on a project and, you know, uh, we're sitting here and, and working away on a project called SCOPE, S-C-O-P-E, the Scientific Coalition on Pest Exclusion, which is just what it sounds of a group of scientists, some of you probably attending right here, you know, as why don't we requeue up exclusion as the number one target? Does the industry embrace that? And if not, why not? And what do we have to change to get, you know, a pest control industry to look at exclusion as being a very profitable source? 
Right. The problem is the public many times, you know, if they say, yeah, I want to keep the mice out of my house and you say, we can do that. It'll cost about $3,000 to repair your house and your soffits and your foundation and, and the gaps below your garage door and so forth. But we can do it. The marketplace doesn't warm up to that very yeah. well. They're like, what? I, what? $3,000 to keep the money? Just put out some sticky traps or something. Give me a much better price, which we can do. But not keeping them out, right? We have to think is once they're in, a mouse or rat inside our buildings, especially now, again, okay, we can put out a trap, a snap trap. We can put out a bait station. We can put something that's going to control them, kill them once they're inside a building. But they're in. They're in. And once they're in, the viruses are in. Whatever's on their feet is in. Whatever's on their bodies, whatever ectoparasites, fleas, ticks, lice, mice, they're in. So I, th I think this whole exclusion thing, Claudia, to your point, you know, I, I'm just, it's just sometimes is frustrating in my career as to why hasn't it really been the number one issue that we try to sell to the public? And it's that conundrum of the public's like, nah, I don't want to spend that much. Yeah, I, I look, I completely understand, <laughs> you know, and, um, you know, there's in some cases, some folks absolutely can't afford anything, but, you know, there's there's quite a bit of information there on how to pest proof. I'm not so sure it's getting to the end user, which is that resident, right? How how do you make it where exclusion isn't so overwhelming um, and people can do it uh, in a process? But anyway, we're not going to solve this issue today, but I think that's something that we really need to, to like look at. Yeah. Um, you're a really prolific writer, so we're always reading something in PCT and so really, um, the one thing I would say on those articles that you write are they're very practical how to and, and some maybe sometimes thinking about it in a different way that you know I haven't or others haven't in our industry. So I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about what you do for sort of the pest management industry itself. Well, I, you know, I've always enjoyed writing actually and to this day and sometimes, you know, when people say, well, you know, what'd you do this morning for fun? I'll say I sat in my writer's garret and wrote something, you know, I wrote a poem, I like poetry, I'll write a short story, I'll write, even writing for myself, sometimes I'll write something for an hour just to get away from everything, just for myself, and my own little journal and this kind of thing. So I do, I do enjoy writing, and um, constantly at it, you know, and it's, for those of you out there that, you know, if, if you write, and you try to write something, uh, you realize, yeah, it can be very enjoyable, but it is hard work. You know, sometimes it'll it'll take uh, half a day to just write one paragraph of something technical, you know, and then you're not satisfied still and you're going back. But um, so, yeah, writing has been a, an important part of my life, an enjoyable part of my life. So um, I'm still at it, still working on. In fact, uh, I'm behind on my I owe my malice chapter, Story Hedges and Dan Wall and those guys. You know, they're waiting for it, you know, and I'm just wrapping that thing up. So I'm still doing the malice thing. Yeah, great. I think, um, you know, another, I think, really enjoyable part of working in this industry is working with interns and um, students and, you know, just different people um, that are up and coming into this uh, area. Um, and I think you've been involved as well from your Purdue days even to today, correct? <laughs> yep, today, um, you know, and especially through the department in um, New York City Department of Health, they have a program where they reach out to uh, college seniors and juniors and for their careers, and they say, come intern with us, and, and we pay them. And so over the years, um, it's it's a great program. Like right here is that woman's Lisa Fang, and she was a Cornell student, a biology student, and went on to med school and so forth. But we're still doing this. In fact, I just finished uh, putting together my projects for this summer's students, um, and they're being posted as we speak, you know, at universities. And we'll bring in three to my department this this summer. You know, and, um, you know, so it's fun. It's fun to mentor. It's it's fun to they have bright minds. Usually they think way outside the box, no filters yet. And sometimes they come up with some really fantastic ideas. And it's, it's just one of the most enjoyable things is to be around students. 
It is, and I think, um, you know, we we also get students from our local universities and their public health program will do practicums. Uh, well, they'll do a practicum with us, which is like a 200 hour hands on experience. And then, of course, we take interns as well. But I will tell you, we've had several already, many that have come through the rodent control program, some going to med school later or uh, some have actually changed their career path and uh, because rodent management you know and the projects have really made an impact um on some of these students so it's it's really pretty exciting to see um you know what these programs can do right. so i think look bobby you know for all of us that are in this area you're working a ton of hours and um you know there's always a family uh, behind us supporting and so you included a picture of ruth i've you know had the pleasure of meeting ruth she is absolutely awesome um but yeah, I'm sure she supports you a ton and is probably very understanding <laughs> because of your schedule, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, you know, I, you know, as you can see, they have best friend in love is Ruth. Yeah. And without Ruth, uh, you know, there's a gazillion things I wouldn't be able to do or have it organized. And she takes care of me. She makes my schedule work and all a gazillion things. And so, yeah. Um, yeah, that's behind the scenes support that I'm so, so lucky to have without a doubt. It's wonderful. That's great. And so um, you've got a home not uh, overlooking, I believe, the Hudson River. And we've got a little photograph there. Absolutely gorgeous. Uh, but imagine you probably go hiking and stuff around there all the time. Well, we're we're by the Hudson River. I we wish we were raw. we were on the Hudson River. <laughs> but that's that's only a twenty minute um, ride away for me when I go for, to get my steps in. Sometimes I take this trail, and that trail ends up right there with that view. I just turn around, and and especially during the summer, the Hudson River. I think many people realize it's one of America's most significant, beautiful rivers of all. And we, we have our, our little hills and mountains in upstate New York and what have you. So, yeah, I like to get out. And that's one of my favorite views to, to hike to. And so definitely, um, Bobby, that you continue to have and have had such a huge impact in the area of rodent management. And I believe you even in I've got a photograph, the next photo have you initialing <laughs> you know <laughs> your initials in some sebum i believe uh, that was going on <laughs> so just a huge impact but i mean i think that's absolutely hilarious uh photo but you know i think as we sort of wrap this this um presentation up you know a lot of times rodent management seems so overwhelming right it's like there's trash and there's people not cooperating and then you've got all these different thing, things going on and and where do you even start right and so I, I like to ask the question if if you were to give three things to everybody that is on this call because uh, around this webinar there's people from all walks of life what would be three things that everybody could do or could do to really help promote rodent management to where it should be in sort of the public, you know, public health importance, because we're constantly talking about how these are these are not just a nuisance, right? They're a pest of public health importance. Not everybody gets that. But with that being said, too, what are small steps that people can do in their own home or at their place of business of, you know, to really help the entire situation? Yeah, great question, Claudia. Um, you know, just for the people at home kind of thing, um, you know, for the resident, for the non-professional person, you know, it is amazing that it is it is basics 101. As we mentioned a little bit earlier, when friends of mine, maybe friends of everybody on this on this seminar, ask, you know, what can I do? We all go to the same spot. We're like look, it's really important not to have any food available on the outside or on the inside to pests, period. You know, you have total control over that for the most part, you know, and, you know, you should keep your, your homes tight, your apartment tight, at wherever you want to keep rodents out. So, and if you can't do that yourself, uh, make sure you hire a pest professional. It's trained in <laughs> pest exclusion. So on the professional end of things, you know, I agree with what you said. You know, we, we actually still have a ways to go. There's plenty of room for growth and innovations in rodent pest management. Um, but, 
you know, when I look at it as a consultant that gets called upon, you know, to help out here and there with tough rodent problems for, at the pest control level, I don't think we do a great job of assessing situations first. You know, we we inspect, you know, we have our flashlights and we inspect, we look for droppings and holes and, and you know, where rodents were active and so forth. But that's not assessment. Inspection is not assessment. And, you know, we need to, you know, build that into our pricing when someone says, well, could you come and tell me how much it's going to cost to get rid of this mouse problem in my my bodega or or our school or whatever it is. And, you know, sometimes I, I think, well, where are the mice coming from? Where are they breeding? What part of the building are they breeding in? Where are their hot spots? If someone said, we're the t top three hot spots of this building for where they're breeding, that's on us. We need to be able to answer that question. That's a pest management professional, right? Which would lead us into, you know, just recently, uh, Matt Fry and myself and some others, you know, we published a paper in, in a referee journal is like, where you put down a piece of a rodent equipment is critical critical you know it's not just lay it down along the wall every 50 feet and see what you get next week you know so we need to assess those factors that are responsible for rodent populations and a mouse infestation say in somebody's home is a population you know so it's it's a case of we need to assess. We need to make sure we're very familiar with the behavior of rodents inside structures mm -hmm. and not relying on equipment to, you know, uh, be pest control. Equipment is not pest control, right? It's it's a tool of pest control, but using equipment is, you know, anybody can lay out equipment. We could tell a homeowner, hey, put, put these out around your basement every 20 feet. And voila, you're doing pest control. We know that's not true. So, it's it's a situation too of and it's difficult you know most people the marketplace will not pay for 100 percent control even though they think they may they're ultimately in rodent control going to get rid of all the rodents well we can get rid of all the rodents as pest professionals but that that's going to take a lot of work and we have we should be charging for that we should be going for a hundred percent and not saying, well, I'll check every month to see what's in the traps and we'll keep them low. So, but the marketplace is just, as I said, for exclusion in many ways, they're like, no, nah, that's too expensive. I'm going to look in the yellow pages and get somebody else. So those are the three things, Claudia, if, for professionals, I would say is, you know, we need to assess, we need to be familiar with behaviors so we can put our equipment in the behavior zones, not the linear zones. And we need to question am I charging enough to get to 100% or darn close to it? Or am I competing, say, just to keep the price so it's going to sell? Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And I think, you know, just from a general observation with working with the industry is that, you know, you still have this, in so, not everybody, but you still have this sort of mindset of that technician needs to do a ton of accounts on a single day and they need to keep up. But I, I think it's so different when it comes to rodent control, you just need more time. And so there needs to, I think, really be an assessment, sort of an industry-wide level of how can we charge for that time to still be profitable, right? But they are going to need more time than just to go to that one account, check the bait stations and go. And so I don't know how you change that really, but I think that's, I'm with you. I think a lot more assessment is absolutely required um, in order for them to have that long term because you're they're going to get callbacks if yes. they don't do these things. I mean, you you're going to spend money somewhere. So yeah. either you're going to have free callbacks that you need to go address, or you're going to address it on the front end, right? So yeah. I think that's that. And I also like from a public standpoint. You know, we're actually doing a survey on one of our projects of, of our, our our public to see what they think about rodents. Is it a nuisance or hey, I just don't have time to deal with it or I don't really care until they're my house. But even then, what am I going to get kicked out of my apartment? You know, if I complain on my landlord, there's just so many complicating factors um, that are involved with rodent control. And, and but I still really believe that the general public doesn't really elevate them to the critical level that they should be. You know, one rodent is too many in any house. 
Correct. And, um, you know, how do you how do you change that? So it's it's tough. I think we have a long way to go still, but wanted to hear your insight on that. <laughs> so anyway, I think we go to the last slide um, with questions from the group. And and Bobby, I can't thank you enough for your time today and um, just coming to chat with us and sharing some of your awesome photographs. Really, absolutely, um, you know, fantastic. And thank you so much for what you do for the industry. I feel very privileged um, that I can work with you. Uh, on projects and I think it's wonderful. We have a actually the attendees in this group. There are just really awesome, fantastic people. And I believe we do have a question. Uh, Stacy, do you wanna, um, we've got a Stacia Carter in the back managing uh, the command center. And um, I don't know if she wants to go through those questions cause I can't see them. Yes, okay. The first question is in a less dense urban city, for instance, Lincoln, Nebraska, where you've spoken before, we have very few, if any, rats. What kind of range will rats, and for that matter, mice roam? We receive occasional complaints of people saying that they have seen a rat, but we rarely found evidence of rats. These are usually in your typical single family home neighborhoods. We have hardly ever had a report of rats in our more dense downtown with bars, restaurants, and a more ready food source. Yeah, it's 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 a wonderful question and thank you. And um, so as you look at the rat distribution, if you will, around the world in, in different areas, you will see, you know, concentrations of obviously cities like, you know, the eastern megalopolis, Boston down to DC is the highest density perhaps of Norway rats, at least in the US. And then, you know, we have the roof rats doing all the coastal areas all the way from, you know, the East Coast back up to Seattle. So, and in between, we have cities, St. Louis, Chicago, you know, um, so forth, and, and uh, Dallas and, and areas that also have their share of rats. But in some areas, and Lincoln, Nebraska is probably one of them, for Probably a combination of reasons. Um, the rats just haven't gotten a foothold there and, and built up uh, in numbers to any degree where they get a critical mass and, and it gets away from them. But one of the things you mentioned in your question is density. And the, the rat to some degree is gonna benefit when there's high density of humans because there's gonna be high density of refuse. But if people are much more spread out, such as, you know, in Nebraska, and yes, there's trash, of course, and you do have your bars and your restaurants and so forth that you mentioned. But if it's never been enough to really give them that start, that initial start to where they can get into population growth, where it grows logarithmically and so forth, like it has in the high density cities, they they just can't get it going. And and two, in Nebraska, when there is a rat complaint, it's probably taken care of pretty well by the Nebraska pest management professionals there, and it, it keeps it from ever getting out of control. And so for sure you have rats, as I think you've acknowledged, um, but they're not just going to get to that critical point of being very numerous into the millions like our other cities. You know, so and I think it it is really about density and nipping it in the bud really quick, like you guys do. Okay, next question. What are the better recommendations for eliminating voles in your yard? Right. So voles in the yard, um, you know, voles are grass eaters, and they they clip the grass and and they you know they make their nest underneath cover such as low-lying bushes or very thick grass and, and this kind of thing, and they duck beneath landscaping. And then they, depending on which species, there's three species of voles, and one is primarily a, somewhat of a subterranean vole, and the, the more common one is the metal vole. It's on top of the ground foraging about. But um, landscaping goes a long way in uh, exposing voles, um, and they're one of the favorite food sources of, you know, predators, hawks and owls at night and, and the, you know, the um, coyotes and the fox and the squirrels. And so they're a primary food source. And so it's a lot of work through landscaping, believe it or not, basic landscaping to keep things from getting covered over 
and the vole really depends on cover for for protection. So um, it's a matter of um, you know keeping bushes from you know forming caves on the ground and and this kind of thing. If they're really out of hand for some reason or another, you know uh, pest professionals can lay down snap traps right in their runways, which are usually very visible, and just cover that over with a shingle or, or a piece of plywood or something like that. And very commonly the voles are, are trapped just by running through the runways blindly. And, and so th that's what I would recommend, landscaping and snap trapping. Okay. What kind of range do mice and rats have in a neighborhood? In neighborhoods, um, you know, root, I'll start with the noi rat, for example. Noi rat has been uh, good research to show, you know, a typical home range, meaning that they do every day and come back to the nest. They can have a radius from 90 to 450 feet. We used to think it was 100 feet, the, the old research, but now through really good, you know, genetics and research, we know a radius from their nest 90 to 450 feet in any direction. Usually they head out for the closest food source. And if, if that happens to be 80 feet, it may only be 80 foot home range. If it happens to be 450, they'll do it. You know, for the house mouse, it's a much smaller mammal. And so in a neighborhood, the house mouse, once it sets up in its nest, you know, it typically tries to stay within about a 30 foot range. However, you know, the house mouse, just like the rat, if it needs to, it will extend that out for 100, even 150 feet, you know, but they'll keep trying to get as close to those food sources as possible. It, little animals have short home ranges. Big animals have big home ranges. Roof rats, you know, as that species, you know, um, they'll have home ranges onwards from 100 to 300 feet out from their nest. And again, probably here and there, foraging about, they'll go occasionally longer, you know, but, you know, those are the typical home ranges. But I would want to emphasize to your question, because it's so, so good, is that resources, the abundance of resources and location of resources will dictate the home ranges. Just like we know, some people will have a long commute to work, they'll say I actually drive an hour both ways to work. You know, it's a long way every single day, but that's what I have to do to make this paycheck and get back to my house that I love in that neighborhood. Well, same with the rodents. You'll have outliers. That will, they'll go way beyond what our textbooks say and sometimes way shorter than what our textbooks will say. What is the best way to get rid of moles? The best way to get rid of moles, M-O-L-E-S, um, is probably through trapping, you know, and there's some very good mole traps on the market. Um, and, but trapping takes a level of expertise. Um, and there's literally people that have mole trapping companies in the United States. So, um, now, for example, you know, the pest manager professional, you, there's a mole bait that Bell Labs puts out. You know, and um, that has had a run of success, you know, it's placed in active burrows and, and this kind of thing. So there's mole baits and there's mole trapping. Um, it is not true since, you know, it still pervades as a myth. It is not true that if you have moles, you must have a grub problem. Uh, moles are opportunists below the soil. They eat a lot of earthworms. They eat anything they bump into down there in their tunnels, including shrews and mice, should they try going into a mole tunnel. So the best approach is either through trapping or through uh, professional baiting. How about commenting on the pros and cons of rodent remote monitoring? Yes, yeah, so, you know, recently within just the past really just the past six, seven years, although there's been remote monitors out now. My first remote monitor, I held in my hand and played with it 14 years ago. And, but just recently, um, there's now several different types of remote monitors and non-remote monitors. And that technology is taking off like crazy. Um, there's probably 12 different manufacturers looking at monitors and using monitors. Um, I think my own personal, because I'm closely involved with, with using one of the monitors, the ActiveSense system, I can tell you that it monitors for rodents are as big as 
when we switch from spraying for cockroaches to baiting for cockroaches, and when we switch for using lots of liquid termiticides to baiting for termites, you know, um, those are giant game changers for us in the pest control industry when we switch to baits, for example. And we'll probably never go back the same way for those animals with that new technology coming forth. That's how I see these sensors. I see the sensors and the power of these sensors and what they can do for us in rotor control. It's, it's enormous. You know, every, everywhere you turn, you can ask yourself, what if I had a sensor here, right? And especially for just the easy reach is ceilings. I have to go in so many ceilings, climb up on ladders and look around and sometimes yes, sometimes no. But rodents love ceilings, roof rats love ceilings, mice love ceilings, noy rats love ceilings. If we're not checking ceilings, that customer is not getting what they think they're getting. But sensors take the sting out of that. So I think sensors are our future. It's just like we went, like I said, to the cockroach baits, we're never gonna go back. You know, sensors really are our future in a big way. Robbie, I think we have uh, time for just a couple more questions. Okay. Um, you did put in, um, in the chat, if there's a question that we didn't get to, um, if the person on the line could just email it to education at NOLA.gov and we'll make sure uh, to get it to you. But um, Stacey, I think a couple more questions. Okay. What is the best way to seal the top of a hollow brick, or no, hollow block wall with only six inches of space to roof decking in a commercial structure? Yeah, so um, in every, every case is going to be different on this, but um, it would be a lot of times you can, if you can use some of the high density, high density foams to fill in the large gap there. And then, you know, with a shallow um, covering over that um, so that, you know, you fully cap off that concrete hollow block where it meets, where it meets the roof area or the, or the line. It's a critical question because those zones, and I'm willing to bet this is why you're asking that, those zones are often overlooked in pest control. And um, if they remain open, they end up, depending on where they are and so forth, to being these nests all over the place. A lot of times you can tell which part of the concrete hollow block wall is a nesting wall and where the, they're going. Just look at the dark stains on, on the concrete hollow block. They'll use those blocks over and over and over again if they remain open. So th those are critical areas, but you know, um, I think high density foam followed by a good cement over that cap, fully cap it is, is the way to go. But it's case by case, depending on the, the construction. Okay, what are your thoughts on the use of CO2 and or CO gas injection systems for rat control in urban residential environments? Absolutely, without a doubt, carbon dioxide, you know, either through dry ice um, or through tanks, you know, is is one of the smartest things we can do uh, for rodent control in boroughs, in borough systems, right? And um, environmentally smart, humane, the whole nine yards. So carbon dioxide is what's used in laboratories around the world, approved as a euthanizing agent by laboratories and humaneness for animal care units and so forth. Carbon monoxide is similar. It's, it's uh, you know, very effective when it's used in um, machines that generate carbon monoxide gas into borough systems. You know, um, so both of those tools are probably going to gain more and more in importance as more and more attention is focusing down on the drawbacks of anticoagulant redenticides and their drift into the environment, into, you know, non-target wildlife. So uh, we did a lot of tests with carbon dioxide dry ice to submit that data to the EPA for uh, registration. And um, for me, it was a life changer, like, wow, this, this is really fantastic for controlling rats, noy rats, especially in ground burrow systems where you're away from buildings. Yeah, Bobby, this is Claudia. I'm gonna just comment on that as well, because here at the city of New Orleans, we've also transitioned to using carbon dioxide. You know, and, you know, for me, one of the most important things, not only for the ground burrows, but it is also killing ectoparasites. And yeah. so we want to make sure that we don't have that disease transmission um, because of the ectoparasites. So for us, I will tell you, we've had areas that 
were very much infested parks with Norway rats and with just consistent and sort of, you know, regular abatement using dry ice, it has vanished, right? Which is really very spectacular. We were just right before this call talking about a problem uh, location that is unbelievable. So it's been a huge change. All right, I think we've got one more question and then we're going to wrap it up. So, Astasia? Will a brush style door sweep keep out mice and rats? My experience is um, no. So, you know, it's certainly better than nothing and it's certainly better than a weather strip. Um, so, but the high density brushes over time, they, they tend to split and warp and, you know, get all kinds of, you know, uh, warped out of space and what have you, and you end up, up with gaps. So my experience is if you're going to pest proof a door, you want to do it right. And if, if you're under mouse and rat pressure, you want to use probably products like the excluder. I'm not with anybody as a consultant, by the way, I'm not putting a plug in or anything, but you want the, uh, you want fabric mesh that is made for, you know, lots of uh, pressure on it and it doesn't warp out and, it, and the rotors can't chew through each and every strand as they can do with the with the brush strips. You know, so um, when we try to rodent proof in New York City against rats and mice, we use the fabric mesh from companies like Excluder. All right, guys, um, Bobby, thank you again so much for your time today. I appreciate everything that um, you've done for us here and, and just an you know, incredible contribution to our industry. So continue to work uh, with everyone and everyone on the call. Thank you again for taking your afternoon, spending it with us and our next. We will have more of these uh, interviews with other professionals. So if you'd like to follow us on our social media, we post everything. We're at NOLA Mosquito. We're at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, things like that. All right, everyone. Thanks again, Bobby. Thanks so much for your time. Have a great Thank day. You. Thank you, everybody. It was an honor to be invited. Thank you. See thanks you. so much. Bye-bye.